Hi there, this is Miss Camp here with your daily Harry Potter update. I have with me a special guest. This is my dog Bridger. I brought him today because he reminds me of the character Hagrid we're going to hear from pretty soon. They both have these beautiful, luxurious beards. Right now, Harry is stuck at the Dursleys over the summer, and he's reading some letters from his buddies at Hogwarts. Unfortunately, one of these letters and packages is moving, though, which is a little troublesome. Let's find out what happens. Harry froze. He knew that Hagrid would never send him anything dangerous on purpose, but then Hagrid didn't have a normal person's view of what was dangerous. Hagrid had been known to befriend giant spiders, buy vicious three-headed dogs for men in pups, and sneak illegal dragon eggs into his cabin. Harry poked the parcel nervously. It snapped loudly again. Harry reached for the lamp on his bedside table, gripped it firmly in one hand, and raised it over his head, ready to strike. Then he seized the rest of the wrapping paper in his other hand and pulled, and out fell, a book. Harry just had time to register its handsome green cover, emblazoned with the golden title, The Monster Book of Monsters, before it flipped on the edge and scuttled sideways along his bed like some weird crab. Uh-oh, Harry muttered. The book toppled off the bed with a loud clunk and shuffled rapidly across the room. Harry followed it stealthily. The book was hiding in the dark space under his desk. Praying that the Dursleys were still fast asleep, Harry got down on his hands and knees and reached out toward it. Ouch! The book snapped on his hand and then flapped past him, still scuttling on its covers. Harry scrambled around, threw himself forward, and managed to flatten it. Uncle Vernon gave a loud, sleepy grunt in the room next door. Hedwig and Errol watched interestedly as Harry clamped the struggling book tightly in his arms, hurried to his chest of drawers, and pulled out a belt, which he buckled tightly around it. The monster book shuddered angrily, but could no longer flap and snap, so Harry threw it on the bed and reached for Hagrid's card. Dear Harry, happy birthday. Think you might find this useful for the next year. Won't say no more here. Tell you when I see you. Hope the buggles are treating you all right. All the best, Hagrid. It struck Harry as ominous that Hagrid thought a biting book would come in useful, but he put Hagrid's card next to Moran and Hermione's, grinning more broadly than ever. Now, there was only the letter from Hogwarts left. Noticing it was rather thicker than usual, Harry slit open the envelope, pulled out the first page of parchment within, and read, Dear Mr. Potter, please note that the new school year will begin on September the 1st. The Hogwarts Express will leave from King's Cross Station, platform 9 and 3 quarters, at 11 o'clock. Third years are permitted to visit the village of Hogsmeade on certain weekends. Please give the enclosed permission form to your parent or guardian to sign. A list of books for the new year is enclosed. Yours sincerely, Professor M. McGonagall, Deputy Headmistress. Harry pulled out the Hogsmeade permission form and looked at it, no longer grinning. It would be wonderful to visit Hogsmeade on weekends. He knew it was an entirely wizarding village, and he had never set foot there. But how on earth was he going to persuade Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia to sign the form? He looked over at the alarm clock. It was now two o'clock in the morning. Deciding he'd worry about the Hogsmeade form when he woke up, Harry got back into bed and reached up to cross off another day on the chart he'd made for himself, counting down the days until his return to Hogwarts. Then he took off his glasses and lay down, eyes open, facing his three birthday cards. Extremely unusual though he was, at that moment Harry Potter felt just like everyone else, glad for the first time in his life that it was his birthday. Chapter 2 Aunt Marge's Big Mistake Harry went down to breakfast the next morning to find the three Dursleys already sitting around the kitchen table. They were watching a brand new television, a welcome home from the summer present for Dudley, who had com been complaining loudly about the long walk between the fridge and the television in the living room. Dudley had spent most of the summer in the kitchen, his piggy little eyes fixed on the screen and his five chins wobbling as he ate continuously. Harry sat down between Dudley and Uncle Vernon, a large beefy man with very little neck and a lot of mustache. Far from wishing Harry a happy birthday, none of the Dursleys made any sign that they had noticed Harry enter their room, but Harry was far used to this to care. He helped himself to a piece of toast and then looked up at the reporter on the television, who was halfway through a report on an escaped convict. The public is warned that Black is armed and extremely dangerous. A special hotline has been set up, and any sighting of Black should be reported immediately. No need to tell us he's no good, snorted, snorted Uncle Vernon staring over the top of his newspaper at his prisoner. 
Look at the state of him, the filthy layabout. Look at his hair. He shot a nasty look sideways at Harry, whose untidy hair had been a great source of annoyance to Uncle Vernon. Compared to the man on the television, however, whose gaunt face was surrounded by a matty, elbow-length tangle, Harry felt very well groomed, and groomed indeed. The reporter had reappeared. The Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries will announce today... Hang on, barked Uncle Vernon, staring furiously at the reporter. You didn't tell us where the maniacs escaped from. What use is that? Lunatic could be coming up the street right now. Aunt Petunia, who was bony and horse-faced, whipped around and peered intently out the kitchen window. Harry knew Aunt Petunia would simply love to be the one to call the hotline number. She was the noisiest woman in the world and spent most of her life spying on the boring, law-abiding neighbors. When will they learn, said Uncle Vernon, pounding the table with a large purple fist, that hanging's the only way to deal with these people. Very true, said Aunt Petunia, who was still squinting next to the ru door's runner beans. Uncle Vernon drained his teacup, glanced at his watch, and added, I better be off in a minute, Petunia. Marge's train gets in at ten. Harry, whose thoughts had been upstairs with the broomstick servicing kit, had brought back to earth with an unpleasant bump. Aunt Marge, he blurted out. She's not coming here, is she? Aunt Marge was Uncle Vernon's sister. Even though she was not a blood relative of Harry's, whose mother had been Aunt Petunia's sister, he had been forced to call her aunt all his life. Aunt Marge lived in the country in a house with a large garden where she bred bulldogs. She didn't often stay at Privet Drive because she couldn't bear to leave her precious dogs but each of her visits stood out horribly vividly in Harry's mind. At Dudley's fifth birthday party, Aunt Marge had whacked Harry around the shins with her walking stick to stop him from beating Dudley at musical statues. A few years later, she had turned up at Christmas with a computerized robot for Dudley and a box of dog biscuits for Harry. On her last visit, the year before Harry started at Hogwarts, Harry had accidentally trodden on the tail of her favorite dog. Ripper had chased Harry into the garden and up a tree, and Aunt Marge had refused to call him off until past midnight. The memory of the incident still brought tears of laughter to Dudley's eyes. Marge will be here for a week, Uncle Vernon snarled. And while we're on the subject, he pointed a fat finger threateningly at Harry. We need to get a few st things straight before I go and collect her. Dudley smirked and withdrew his gaze from, gaze from the television. Watching Harry being bullied by Uncle Vernon was Dudley's favorite form of entertainment. Firstly, growled Uncle Vernon. You keep a civil tongue in your head while you're talking to Marge. All right, said Harry bitterly, if she does when she's talking to me. Secondly, said Uncle, Verge, Uncle Vernon, acting as though he had not heard Harry's reply, as Marge doesn't know anything about your abnormality, I don't want any funny stuff while she's here. You'll behave yourself. Got me? I will if she does, said Harry through gritted teeth. And thirdly, said Uncle Vernon, his mean little eyes now slits in his great purple face, We've told Marge you've attended St. Brutus's Secure Center for Incurably Criminal Boys. What? Harry yelled. And you'll be sticking to that story, boy, or there'll be trouble, spat Uncle Vernon. Harry sat there, white-faced and furious, staring at Uncle Vernon, hardly, be able, hardly able to believe it. Aunt Marge coming for a week-long visit. It was the first worst birthday present the Dudleys had ever given him, including that pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Well, Petunia, said Uncle Vernon, Getting heavily to his feet, I'll be off to the station then. Want to come along for the ride, Dudders? No, said Dudley, whose attention had returned to the television now that Uncle Vernon had finished threatening Harry. Dudley got to make himself smart for his auntie, said Aunt Petunia, smoothing Dudley's thick blonde hair. Mummy's brought him a lovely bow tie. Uncle Vernon clapped Dudley on his porky shoulder. See you in a bit then, he said, and he left the kitchen. Harry, who had been sitting in a kind of horrified trance, had a sudden idea. Abandoning his toes, he got quickly from his feet and followed Uncle Vernon to the front door. Uncle Vernon was pulling out his car coat. I'm not taking you, he snarled when he turned to see Harry watching him. Like I'd want to come, said Harry coolly. I want to ask you something. Uncle Vernon eyed him suspiciously. Third years at my school are allowed to visit the village sometimes, said Harry. So, snapped Uncle Vernon taking his car keys from the hook next to the door. I need you to sign the permission form, said Harry in a rush. And why should I do that? Uncle Vernon sneered. Well, said Harry, choosing his words carefully, it'll be hard work pretending Aunt Marge, pretending to Aunt Marge that I go to St. Wetsit's, St. Brutus's Secure Center for Incurably Criminal Boys, bellowed Uncle Vernon, and Harry was pleased to hear a definite tone of panic in Uncle Vernon's voice. 
Exactly, said Harry, looking calmly up into Uncle Vernon's large purple face. It's a lot to remember. I'll have to make it sound convincing, won't I? What a what if I accidentally let it slip? You'll get the stuffin' knocked out of you, won't you? Roared Uncle Vernon, advancing on Harry with his fist raised. But Harry stood his ground. Knocking the stuffing out of me won't make Aunt Marge forget what I could tell her, he said grimly. Uncle Vernon stopped, his fist still raged, a face of ugly puce. But if you sign my permission form, Harry went on quickly, I swear I'll remember where I'm supposed to go to school, and I'll act like I'm, a, I'll act like I'm normal and everything. Harry could tell that Uncle Vernon was thinking it over, even if his teeth were bared and a vein was throbbing on his temple. Right, he snapped firmly. I shall monitor your behavior carefully during Marge's visit. If at the end of it you've towed the line and kept the story, I'll sign your ready form. He wheeled around, pulled open the kitchen door, and slammed it so hard that one of the little panes of glass at the top fell out. Harry didn't return to the kitchen. He went back upstairs to his bedroom. If he was going to act like a real muggle, he better start now. Slowly and sadly, he gathered up all of his presents and birthday cards and hid them under the loose floorboard with his homework. Then he went to Hagrid's, Hagrid's cage. Hedwig's cage. Errol seemed to have recovered. He and Hedwig were both asleep, heads under their wings. Harry sighed and poked them both awake. Hedwig, he said gloomily, we're going to have to clear off for a week. Go with Errol. Ron will look after you. I'll write him a note explaining. And don't look like, look like, look like me at that. Hedwig's large, amber eyes were reproachful. It's not my fault. It's the only way I'll be allowed to visit Hogsmeade with Ron and Hermione. Ten minutes later, Errol and Hedwig, who had a note to Ron bound to her leg, soared out of the window and out of sight. Harry, now feeling thoroughly miserable, put the empty cage away inside his wardrobe. But Harry didn't have long time to brood. And then next to no time, Aunt Petunia was shrieking down the stairs for Harry to come down and get ready to welcome their guest. Do something with your hair, Aunt Petunia snapped as she reached the hall. Harry couldn't see the point of trying to make his hair lie flat. Aunt Marge loved criticizing him, so the untidier he looked, the happier she would be. All too soon, there was a crunch of gravel outside Uncle Vernon's car, pulling up in the driveway, then the clunk of the car door and footsteps on the path of the garden. Get the door, Aunt Petunia hissed at Harry. A feeling of great gloom in his stomach, Harry pulled the door open. On the threshold stood Aunt Marge. She was very like Uncle Vernon. Large, beefy, purple-faced. She even had a mustache, though not as bushy as his. In one hand, she held out an enormous suitcase, and tucked under the other was an old and evil-tempered bulldog. "'Where's my dudders?' roared Aunt Marge. "'Where's my nephew Pooh?' Dudley came waddling down the hall, his blonde hair plastered flat to his flat head, a bow tie just visible under his many chins. Aunt Marge thrust the suitcase into Harry's stomach, knocking the wind out of him, seized Dudley in a tight one-armed hug, and planted a large kiss on his cheek. Harry knew perfectly well that Dudley only put up with Marge's hugs because he knew he was paid for it, and sure enough, when they broke apart, Dudley had a crisp twenty-pound note clenched in his fat fist. Petunia! shouted Aunt Marge, striding past Harry as though she were a hat stand. Aunt Marge and Petunia kissed, or rather, Aunt Marge bumped her large jaw against Aunt Petunia's bony cheekbone. Uncle Vernon came in now, smiling jovially as he shut the door. Tea, Marge, he said, and what will R Ripper take? Ripper can have some tea out of my saucer, said Aunt Marge, as they all trooped into the kitchen, leaving Harry alone in the hall with the suitcase. But Harry wasn't complaining. Any excuse not to be with Marge was fine by them, so he began to heave the case upstairs into the spare bedroom, taking as long as he could. By the time he got back to the kitchen, Aunt Marge had been supplied with tea and fruitcake, and Ripper was lapping noiselessly, noisily in his corner. Harry saw Aunt Petunia wince slightly as specks of tea and drool flecked her clean floor. Aunt Petunia hated animals. "'Who's looking after the other dogs, Marge?' Uncle Vernon asked. "'Oh, I've got Colonel Fluster managing them,' boomed Aunt Marge. "'He's retired now, good for him for having something to do, but I couldn't leave poor old Ripper. He pines if he's away from me.' Ripple, Ripper began to growl, and as Harry sat down, this directed Marge's attention to Harry for the first time. So, she barked, still here, are you? Yes, said Harry. Don't you say yes in that ungrateful tone, Aunt Marge growled. It's damn good of Uncle Vernon and Petunia to keep you. Wouldn't have done it myself. You've gone straight to an orphanage if you'd been dumped on my doorstep. All right, that's where we're going to end for today. Have a great one. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.